Welcome to worship at St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. All around the world, the church today is celebrating Palm Sunday, the annual observance of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, a vast crowd surrounding him, shouting their belief, he is the Messiah sent by God to end Roman oppression. The joy of the people is palpable. Palm Sunday has another name, however, Passion Sunday. The commemoration of joy and hope about which I just spoke darkly pivots to the onset of anger and betrayal. Almost without time for us to ponder what has happened, the gospel writers all set the stage for the crucifixion of Jesus. Emotional whiplash is about to be ours, friends. So gather now and experience through music and the word both the highs and lows of this meaningful day that so powerfully informs our collective Christian faith. Please join me now in the call to worship using words from the 11th chapter of the Gospel of Mark. Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Let us worship Almighty God. As we prepare to come before God in prayer, we know that we have much to confess. So let us face this day of palms and Jesus' passion with honesty, trusting in God's steadfast love. As we pray together, Sovereign God, we confess that we are as fickle as the crowds in Jerusalem. When everything goes well, we join the Hosanna chorus. But in times of weariness or hardship, our praise can turn to insult. We hide our faith when it is under attack and link ourselves with the scoffers. When an opportunity to speak a good word for Jesus Christ arises, we are silent. Our church shares mixed messages before the world because we, its members, have not been faithful. We need your forgiving love today, O oh God, more than ever before. And so hear our prayer. Amen. Friends, the Lord God helps us. We will not be disgraced. Sisters and brothers, beyond the shadow of doubt, our sins are forgiven. By the mercy of Jesus Christ, we stand together, forgiven and free. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone. Today is the Sunday before Easter. Do you know what that makes today? 
Palm Sunday. Some of you may remember Palm Sunday in the past. We parade around the sanctuary, waving our palms, saying Hosanna. But what on earth does this actually mean, and why do we celebrate it? So Palm Sunday is the first day of what we call Holy Week, which is the week leading up to Easter. Today, we celebrate Jesus coming into the city of Jerusalem, which is where he died. Now, I want you all to close your eyes as I tell the story. I want to, um, you to imagine that you are there. All right, close your eyes. Jesus was going into Jerusalem for a festival called Passover. Think of festivals and parades that you might have been to in the past. What did they look like, sound like, smell like? On the day he entered, he rode into the city on a donkey that had never been ridden before. And as he rode into Jerusalem, People shouted, Hosanna, which means save us. As Jesus was riding the donkey, people laid their coats on the ground to cover the dirt road, and they waved palm branches in the air to welcome Jesus. Now open your eyes. Could you picture picture Jesus riding on a donkey with cloaks and coats on the ground and branches in the air? Could you hear the sound of people shouting? Could you smell a city that was getting ready for a big parade and a festival? This celebration and welcoming of Jesus was done with joy and delight. But after all of that joy comes Jesus' death. It's hard to think about the sadness and the joy. But as we get ready for Easter, we remember this week isn't just about parades, Easter egg hunts, and Easter lunches. It's also about remembering that Jesus died for us because he loved us so very, very much. Let's pray, and you can repeat after me. Dear God, we know that you love us. Sometimes we only think about the good of Easter. Help us to also remember the reason for Easter. It's in your son's Jesus. Name we pray. Amen. I want to remind you all that following next Easter Sunday's virtual worship service, we'll all be gathering here at the church around 12 o'clock till about 1.30. I want to invite all of you to bring a picnic lunch and plan to be with your St. Andrew's family en masse as we celebrate the resurrection out on the parking lot. So uh, bring lunch and bring flowers for the uh, cross outside and bring a mask to mingle and a good time will be had by all. Before we do that next Sunday, we first turn to the text for this Sunday, Palm and Passion Sunday. It is uh, from the Gospel of St. Mark, selected verses. And I invite you now to listen to the other side of the story for this Sunday. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, you say so. Then the chief priest accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole cohort. And they clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. And they began saluting him, Hail, King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified Jesus. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. 
At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he's calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was God's son. Let us pray. Speak the word you have for us this day, O God. Comfort those of us who need comfort. Welcome those who feel excluded. Challenge those who are complacent. And move each of us to risk more fearlessly, to love more passionately, and to live more intentionally as Christ's disciples. Amen. The most radical thing that Christians believe is not that there is a God, The most radical thing Christians believe is that there's a God who cares, cares about creation and about humanity, a God who actually cares about you and me. Believing that some distant, vague, utterly removed creative force simply exists is very much a theological cakewalk. But believing in a God of love, a God of compassion, a God who cares, is another thing altogether. I would even say that believing in the existence of God probably makes a marginal difference in how a person leads his life. But trusting in a God who cares, trusting in a God who loves, a God who is somehow with us, makes a difference in the world. As I mentioned earlier, today is not just Palm Sunday, it is also Passion Sunday. The Palm Sunday part recalls the ironically joyful entrance into Jerusalem that choirs and children have always recreated so very well. It's ironically joyful because we all know what lies in that parade's path a few days later. The Palm Sunday part of today was unfolded in the passage from Mark that we used for our call to worship this morning. The Passion Sunday part, we just heard from the chapter 15 of Mark, remembers the last days of Jesus' life, his arrest and trial, his torture, and finally his death on the cross. To be sure, most of us prefer the first part of this Sunday's focus over the second part. It is more agreeable to remember a crowd that shouted Hosanna than one who shouted crucify. Somebody told me a story once about watching a group of young kids playing Jesus. They reenacted Christmas and Jesus' sojourn in the wilderness and then his baptism. They acted out Jesus preaching the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus telling a parable. They did a good job with the Palm Sunday parade and all the way up to the Last Supper of Thursday night, actually. But then the little boy who was playing Jesus got a kind of a worried look on his face and looked around and said to his playmates, maybe we should play something else now. Both the Palm and Passion narratives are read in churches on this day for very good reasons. First, there are plenty of people watching today. There will not be as many this Thursday night when we spend more time with the words I just read and others related to them. That decline in attendance is the adult version of maybe we should play something else now. Secondly, as I've repeatedly said over the years, you really cannot come fully to the light of Easter morning without passing through the dark of Thursday night first. That's how the whole story goes. And equally to the point, that's how life goes as well. We need to hear the whole story because it is the whole truth about Christ and about us. The passion story is the definitive enactment of our trust in a God who cares, 
a God who loves humanity, a God who loves you and loves me unconditionally. The Passion tells the whole truth about a God who loves us quite literally to death. Not long ago, I sat with a longtime friend in a Memphis hospital. Her husband had recently been diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia and had been hospitalized at that point for nine weeks, struggling to get strong enough to endure a bone marrow transplant that was in his future. His only hope for survival, really. A bright and faithful family man, as well as a successful attorney, Scott had lost most of his resolve to fight in those days prior to my visit. And when I saw him, he was cordial but distant, ready to get out of neutral and out of his four-walled medical prison, whether that meant having the transplant or moving on to the life eternal. In that darkened room and with my face covered by a surgical mask, I prayed for wholeness and healing as the three of us leaned on Jesus to hear us. As a pastor, I have been pulled into many such scenes in my life. Perhaps you have as well. This one was harder than most, however. My friend's husband has known suffering aplenty, but has tried to be optimistic in my presence. He was philosophical. We even had a laugh or two. But it's still what it is. That hospital room, the rough road ahead, difficult decisions to come. In the face of suffering and loss, I have learned there are several things people say. Some of them are unfortunate. Some of them are so-so. Yet to my mind, there is just one thing to say that is good enough. First, people in these days of cynical postmodernism often think, but seldom say, it's all random and pointless. Live with it. Years ago, the Old Life magazine ran a feature article that asked 49 oddly assorted Americans to pin a few words in response to the question, what are we here for? The respondents included movie stars and working folks, even a handful of philosophers and theologians. One of them, a New York cabbie named Jose Martinez, offered a startlingly frank and dismal answer to the why are we here question. We're here to die, he wrote. Just live and die. I drive a cab. I do some fishing, take my girl out, pay taxes, do a little reading, and then get ready to drop dead. You've got to be strong about it, he said. Of course, I couldn't say that to my friend in the hospital. I'd never say it, but not just because it would be cruel, of course. I wouldn't say it because I don't believe it's true, at least not fully. Another unfortunate thing people sometimes really do say in the face of suffering is something like, this experience will make you a stronger person. This is often true, but it's not good enough. Suffering has indeed deepened many a soul. Loss has really grown people into more compassionate human beings, yes. But the hard truth is there's just no way to justify the depth of so much suffering with whatever good may come from it. In some of his early thinking, C.S. Lewis suggested suffering might be what he called God's alarm clock a divine device to awaken us to what really matters. Later in life, as he watched his own wife die of bone cancer at the age of 45, C.S. Lewis changed his mind about suffering being God's alarm clock. No alertness of soul could ever compensate for her pain and for his loss. The good that can come from suffering is sometimes a word that might be spoken. There's truth in that. But I could hardly say such a thing to my 63-year-old friend in the hospital. Another answer to suffering is found in the Old Testament, in the book of Job. Job, as you may have previously discovered, is all about suffering. The title character, a cartoon of upright prosperity, 
himself suffers loss and pain beyond conceiving. He is deathly ill. He loses his fortune. His children are killed in a freak accident. The bulk of the book consists of off-putting speeches made by a series of long-winded friends of Job who visit him in his affliction, generally telling him he must have done something to deserve his fate. It's nice that they visited, but they'd have done better to hold their tongues, I think. Job stubbornly responds that he may not be perfect, but by no means does he deserve what he got. The book ends with a better response than his so-called comforters could give him, but it's still not quite good enough. In the final chapters of Job, he experiences a vision of God, a divine apparition, and in some of the most gorgeous poetry in all of Scripture, the voice of God basically says to Job and to us, I'm God and you are not. What do you know, Job? And therein lies the unfathomable mystery of it all. Who knows, I, I might have hinted at some of this to my friend in the hospital as an answer, but it's a mystery is small comfort to someone like Scott, if any, at all. The only answer that I could give with any comfort to someone who's suffering, whether illness or loss, depression or fear, the only answer I have is to remind them that I believe God is with them every step of the hard journey. That is exactly the promise of the passion story that we just read. Passion means suffering, of course, and it is precisely in Christ's suffering that God enacts the promise to be with us through it all. And planted as it is at the very center of the whole story, the cross makes Christian faith radically and inescapably accessible. By the cross, God declares in a way deeper than any words these truths. There is no pain that you may bear that I have not borne. There is no darkness that can overtake you that I have not seen. There is no fear that might grip you that I have not known. And that might come to you. I have passed through. I have been there. And when you come to pass through it, know that I am with you. None of this explains away suffering, I realize. The cross, friends, is simply the sign for all time, for all time, that God is with us through it all. God is with us. But then, of course, the cross isn't the end of the story, is it? That's for next week. That's what I told my friend in the hospital. I told him about the cross, that God was with him. And then I told him about next Sunday. Let us affirm our faith as we say together, we trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain, 
and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, and delivering us from death to life eternal. This first day of Holy Week, Palm Passion Sunday, we have faced yet another tragedy in our country, another mass shooting. Even so, God loves us. God loves this world passionately. And trusting in that love, let us go to God in this time of morning prayer. Let us pray. O God, whose might and mercy is beyond our knowing and imagining, out of love you came to us as a human being, whose journey led him to enter Jerusalem. There he was greeted with a parade of palms and well-wishers. But soon the celebration turned to betrayal, loneliness, and suffering. And by a week's end, he was nailed to a wooden torture beam where our Lord breathed his last breath. Oh God, how did you bear the grief, knowing what we did to him? And how do we bear the burden of despair and sorrow that we have faced so many times, wondering how we can ever move beyond the cruelty and violence that we inflict on one another? Dare we hope for the time when all your children, our brothers and sisters, reach out with love, seeking the good for one another. In this holiest of weeks, we acknowledge the very depths to which you have gone to show us a better way, a way of love, mercy, and justice. Help us to make this time a turning point a time of returning to you. Raise us in hope for a new world through the reconciling love of Jesus Christ, a world in which all victims of violence, persecution, and shame stand with you in peace. We pray for all those who are broken in body, mind, and heart and for those who despair that nothing will ever change. Strengthen us, your church, to be your brave and faithful people. Keep us obedient to him whose name is above every name, Jesus Christ, in whose name we are bold to pray as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
And now may God's grace, peace, and mercy from the God we know as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be in you and with you and flowing through you on this day and then every day of your life. May it be so.